Today is July 4th, 2024. Happy Independence Day to my fellow Americans. As I understand it, it's also voting day in the UK. More on that in a bit. My name is Nicodemus and welcome back to the Disruptive Technologies Podcast. Today we're diving into some of the most pressing developments in the tech world. We've got a lot to cover from the UK's election potential impact on cryptocurrency to major legal battles in the US involving the SEC and the CFTC. From international movements in blockchain and crypto regulation to the latest advancements in AI, its risks as reported by leading tech companies, and some intriguing updates on security in the crypto space, we've got it all. So buckle up because it's going to be a time. As I said, it's voting day in the UK. Opinion polls indicate that the UK's Labour Party might win today's general election. If Keir Starmer becomes Prime Minister, he should consider pursuing Rishi Sunak's goal of making the UK a global crypto hub. The Labour Party's stance on crypto is still unclear, but Shadow Finance Minister Rachel Reeves has shown openness to the tech sector. Shadow City Minister Tulip Sadiq also said that Labour would transform the UK into a global center for tokenized assets, if they win. Nigel Green is the CEO of Devere Group. He mentioned that Labour plans to embrace securities tokenization and a central bank digital currency. Green stressed the need for a clear regulatory framework to establish the UK as a global crypto hub. He believes a well-defined regulatory environment would provide clarity and security to businesses and investors. By working with industry leaders, a labor government could ensure balanced regulations, fostering innovation while safeguarding the financial system. This approach would make the UK attractive for crypto companies seeking stability and support. The City of London has historically been a leading financial center, and it could benefit from embracing cryptocurrency and blockchain technology. A combination of London's robust financial infrastructure and progressive crypto regulations could attract international businesses and investors. This would position the UK as a global leader in cryptocurrency, driving economic growth while creating jobs and nurturing innovation. Stand with Crypto is a Coinbase-linked advocacy group. In mid-June, they outlined seven UK crypto policy recommendations ahead of the election. The group's manifesto promotes the UK as a global Web3 and tokenization hub, and they suggest the creation of a joint industry-government task force. They recommend swift legislation for crypto assets and regulating fiat-backed stablecoins to foster competition in digital payments. The group also prioritizes recognizing staking as a regulated activity and ensuring retail participation in proof-of-stake blockchains. In the U.S., the current election cycle has politicians taking a stand on cryptocurrency. Donald Trump has promised to be the crypto president, while some Democrats are showing a willingness to support crypto reform. The White House recently rehired Carol House. House is an expert on crypto regulation. This might signal the importance of digital assets to the Biden administration. Politicians recognize that cryptocurrency owners make up a large portion of the American public and are appealing to their economic interests. This election cycle shows that crypto is now a mainstream issue with a well-organized industry presence. Crypto user demographics align with the highly sought swing voters, making their votes crucial for both parties. While politicians might pivot if crypto prices dip, the need for campaign funds means that they will continue to accept crypto donations. Some lawmakers from either the UK or the US might use crypto as a diversionary tactic. But I tell you what, those politicians on either side of the pond that are out of touch with the public's interest in crypto will face the consequences at the ballot box. The upcoming U.S. elections could significantly impact the future of crypto and blockchain technology, with potential laws enabling or stifling new technologies. Overall, the crypto movement is here to stay, demanding attention and action from politicians and policymakers alike. The U.S. Securities Exchange Commission is seeking to dismiss a lawsuit by BIBA and the DeFi Education Fund on March 25th. The suit asks a judge to declare BIBA's self-titled token not a security. The SEC argues that the lawsuit is premature and based on a non-existent policy. BIBA claims that the SEC will label BIBA tokens as securities and take legal action. They referenced remarks made by SEC Chair Gary Gensler in 2022. The SEC contends that there's no such policy and that BIBA has not shown any imminent regulatory threat. The SEC adds that BIBA failed to identify any specific SEC action reflecting the alleged policy. BIBA argues that the SEC violated the Administrative Procedure Act by avoiding the rulemaking process. The SEC states that an unwritten policy or enforcement threat is not a rule under the APA. The SEC claims immunity from lawsuits unless it takes formal action, like rulemaking. They emphasize that statements by individual commissioners do not represent official SEC policies. Now, let's stick with the SEC a bit longer for our next story. Over a dozen major U.S. tech companies have filed risk factor reports with the SEC, indicating that AI could threaten company finances. These reports show internal concerns about the potential pitfalls of investing in AI. Companies like Adobe, Google, Meta, Microsoft, and NVIDIA are filing these warnings. Microsoft emphasized the risks of lawsuits over AI-driven copyright infringement. Adobe noted that AI could undermine Photoshop's market share. Meta warned that AI tools could spread misinformation. These warnings are intended to protect companies from legal liability for foreseeable risks, ensuring transparency for investors. Despite these concerns, investments in AI remain strong. Stocks of AI leaders like NVIDIA and Microsoft have soared, creating the first $3 trillion companies. 
The crypto market has also seen highs in 2024. That's partly due to regulatory steps like approving the first spot Bitcoin ETF in January. However, the crypto community feels U.S. regulatory progress is too slow. Ethereum co-founder Vitalik Buterin criticized the lack of clarity, blaming it for the rise of useless coins. He suggested that less transparent crypto projects are less likely to be labeled as securities. Applying big tech's approach to risk reporting could force more transparency in the crypto world, potentially weeding out those less viable projects. This alignment could benefit the industry by promoting clearer, more transparent disclosures and investor protections. An Illinois judge ordered an Oregon man and his company to pay over $120 million in a fraud and misrepresentation case. The U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission accused Sam Ickerty and his company, Jaffa LLC, of operating a Ponzi-like scheme. They solicited $44 million from at least 170 investors through a website and YouTube videos, promising to hold and trade digital assets and derivatives. Judge Mary Rowland found that Ickerty and his firm made material misrepresentations and failed to register with the CFTC. The court ordered restitution to victims. And while all that's interesting, this is the important part. The ruling also declared that OM and Klima, two smaller cryptocurrencies, are commodities. The decision establishes the CFTC's jurisdiction over these cryptocurrencies, which typically fall under the same class as Bitcoin. The CFTC's chair, Rostin Benham, has classified Ether as a commodity. Meanwhile, SEC Chair Gary Gensler argues that most cryptocurrencies are securities, though his stance on Ether is unclear. This ongoing debate impacts regulatory jurisdiction over various digital assets. Ickerty's firm, Jaffia LLC, promised investors an 18% annual interest through a crypto savings note. Wise listeners of this show know that that's way too high, that something had to be wrong. However, funds were invested instead in cryptocurrencies like Omen Klima. The order noted that Ikerty used new investment funds to pay off earlier investors. That's typical of a Ponzi scheme. Despite the ruling, legal experts suggest that the classification of Omen Klima might not substantially impact future cases. This case demonstrates the ongoing struggle between regulatory bodies like the CFTC and the SEC over digital asset jurisdiction emphasizing the importance of clear regulatory frameworks for cryptocurrencies. Looking abroad, the German government has made recent Bitcoin transfers. Over 3,000 Bitcoin, valued at $172 million, were transferred from a wallet linked to the German government. On July 4th, 1,300 Bitcoin worth $75 million went to three exchanges, Coinbase, Kraken, and Bitstamp. At the same time, 1,700 Bitcoin were moved to a separate wallet. This activity was reported by blockchain investigator Peck Shield Alert and confirmed by Cointelegraph. It shows Germany's continued selling of its Bitcoin holdings. Since February 2024, the German government wallet has held 50,000 Bitcoin. That Bitcoin was seized from the pirate movie website Movie2K. The wallet has been active, moving large amounts of Bitcoin, including a recent 6,500 Bitcoin transfer valued at $425 million. These transfers increase selling pressure on Bitcoin, as both Germany and the U.S. have been offloading seized Bitcoin. The recent moves have raised concerns among traders about potential negative impacts on Bitcoin's price. Tron founder Justin Sun offered to buy Germany's Bitcoin holdings off-market to minimize this impact. He made this offer public on July 4th to his 3.5 million followers, expressing his willingness to negotiate with the German government. Despite the ongoing transfers, it remains unclear which authority is overseeing the sales. A spokesperson for the Federal Crime Police Office indicated that the responsibility lies with the relevant public prosecutor's office or court. As Germany continues its Bitcoin selling spree, the crypto community watches closely, aware of the potential market impacts. From Germany, let's head over to Nigeria, where prosecutors are moving forward with a case against Tigran Gambarian. Gambarian is a Binance executive that Nigeria detained last February. The Economic and Financial Crimes Commission has charged Gambarian and his fellow Binance executive Nadim Anjawala with money laundering. Anjawala escaped custody in March and reportedly fled to Kenya. Gambarian's trial will resume on July 5th. His family reports that his health has been deteriorating since his detention. He suffered from double pneumonia, malaria, and reported aches and pains. Gambarian's wife, Yuki, has been in contact with U.S. officials, but not the Nigerian government. She criticized the slow response from the U.S. government initially, but noted increased efforts recently. She believes that the issues between Binance and the Nigerian authorities should be resolved without Gambarian being caught in the middle. And I agree. I thought the days of governments holding innocent people hostage were over, but that's what Nigeria is doing. The charges stem from a February trip by Gambarian and Njerwala to Nigeria as Binance representatives. Although Andrew Walla escaped to Kenya, he still faces potential extradition. While tax evasion charges have been dropped, the money laundering case continues. U.S. Representatives French Hill and Chrissy Houlihan visited Gambarian in prison on June 20th. As a result, they're calling for his release on humanitarian grounds. A petition to bring him back to the U.S. has garnered broad support. At the same time, Nigeria's SEC has introduced new rules for virtual asset service providers. They're required to establish an office in Nigeria, and their CEO must reside locally to qualify for regulatory programs. 
This move is part of Nigeria's effort to regulate the crypto industry and ensure compliance. Now, personally, if I owned one of these companies, I wouldn't do it. If that means my company doesn't get to work in Nigeria, so be it. I'm not going to put myself or anybody else at risk of being summarily kidnapped and held hostage by the Nigerian government. The SEC requires virtual asset service providers to submit detailed operational plans and financial reports regularly. Non-compliance could result in hefty fines and possibly imprisonment. The Nigerian government is also advancing with technological progress. The National Information Technology Development Agency plans to establish research centers across the country to focus on new technologies like AI, blockchain, and the Internet of Things. That initiative is intended to position Nigeria as a leader in tech innovation and support startups in these fields. The U.S. and Nigeria are engaging in discussions to strengthen ties in the digital economy and emerging technologies. Nigeria's efforts also include launching its first multilingual large language model, further pushing its AI development. These changes demonstrate Nigeria's ambitions to become a major player in the tech sector while balancing the regulatory aspects of the expanding crypto industry, and doing so poorly, I might add. From Nigeria, let's head over to Cambodia for a CDBC alert. They're the site of a new pilot program for universal trusted credentials. UTC is a digital credentialing system by the United Nations Development Program. The Definity Foundation is the creator of the Internet Computer Blockchain, and they're collaborating with the UN on this initiative. The Internet Computer will secure and manage the UTC infrastructure. Singapore Monetary Authority and other entities help the UN develop UTC. Launched in November, the UTC intends to evolve micro, small, and medium enterprises in the digital economy. The pilot will eventually expand to 10 countries. Definity's Dominic Williams emphasized that those smaller enterprises are crucial to economies and that the UTC can increase transparency and inclusion in a financial system that often neglects them. The Monetary Authority of Singapore and the Bank of Ghana tested UTC with proof of concept in May. They used semi-fungible tokens to transfer licenses and trade records and to perform know-your-customer verification. And actually, Cambodia is an ideal location for this pilot. The Securities Exchange Regulator of Cambodia has partnered with Binance to develop digital asset regulation. Cambodia's CDBC-like Baekong currency operates on the Alipay retail network and inspired Laos' proposed central bank digital currency. Internet Computer is building a decentralized ecosystem that's meant to be an alternative to cloud providers. It's introduced a protocol for verifying Web3 users' identities without relying on wallets. Additionally, it offers a platform for government agencies and enterprises to use private cloud hardware, which is good for cybersecurity. And we're going to be talking about cybersecurity later on in the show. This pilot program marks an essential step towards integrating blockchain technology into Cambodia's financial landscape, potentially transforming its digital economy and providing greater opportunities for smaller businesses. The Basel Committee on Banking Supervision has approved a new framework for banks to disclose their exposure to crypto assets. This mandate must be implemented by the start of 2026. The goal is to support market discipline and ensure enough information is available to evaluate risk. The committee is part of the Bank for International Settlements, and they're the central bank for central bankers. They're supposed to publish details later this month. The Bank for International Settlements sets the standards for potential banks. This finalized framework includes public tables and templates for banks' crypto asset exposures. It requires banks to disclose qualitative information on their crypto activities and quantitative information on their crypto exposure. The framework comes after reviewing responses to a consultation published in December 2022. The committee also approved targeted revisions to the Crypto Asset Prudential Standard. These revisions are intended to promote a consistent understanding of the standard. This includes criteria for stablecoins to receive a preferential Group 1B regulatory treatment. This new set of rules is meant to ensure that banks provide clear and consistent information about their involvement with crypto assets. This transparency is crucial for evaluating the risks associated with crypto assets. Bitcoin's recent halving event on April 19th cut minor rewards in half. This has led to signs of minor capitulation. The underperforming machines are being turned off, and miners have started selling Bitcoin to hedge exposure. Historically, minor capitulation signals a price bottom. Crypto quant data shows that miners have been underpaid since April. Total daily revenues dropped from $79 million on March 6th to $29 million now. Initial excitement from ordinals in the rooms protocol boosted fees, but transaction fee revenue is now just 3.2% of daily revenues, the lowest since April 8th. Post having the decrease in the supply of Bitcoin active within 90 days is an important development. This decrease, coupled with the reduced profitability of older processors, has led some miners to disconnect from the network. After hitting a record high hash rate on April 27th, there's been a 7.7% drawdown, nearing a four-month low. Spikes in minor outflows suggest that they're selling coins to hedge exposure. As the three-month halving anniversary nears, the supply of Bitcoin active within 90 days has been noticeably decreased. This reduced volume is a pain point for miners hoping transaction fees would offset reduced block rewards. Bitcoin mining companies are adapting. They're investing in newer processors and securing global energy contracts. A number of them are also converting their mining hash rate into AI services, 
And like I said, minor capitulation has been associated with price bottoms. A similar hash rate drawdown followed FTX's collapse in November 2022. Bitcoin's price fell below 17000 but then rose. As I write this, Bitcoin is around $60,000. It's down about 3.5% in the last 24 hours. Now moving on to the topic of cybersecurity. Consensus has acquired WalletGuard to enhance the security of MetaMask. WalletGuard is known for its real-time scam detection browser extension. It will be integrated into MetaMask. This integration protects users from theft, scams, and fraud by improving drainer detection and transaction validation. The acquisition follows MetaMask's integration of blockade security alerts across multiple chains. These alerts are projected to save hundreds of millions of dollars in crypto assets from theft in 2024. Last year, over $1.7 billion of crypto was stolen through scams, emphasizing the need for advanced security measures. WalletGuard's team will join consensus and work within the MetaMask product safety department. MetaMask remains the leading crypto wallet. They have over 30 million monthly active users. Joe Levin is the CEO at Consensus. He reiterated their commitment to prioritizing user safety and supporting Web3's mass adoption through the acquisition of WalletGuard. In addition to this acquisition, Consensus recently launched pooled staking for MetaMask. This allows users to stake Ether and earn rewards while contributing to Ethereum network security. WalletGuard co-founder Om Shaw expressed excitement about enhancing security for MetaMask users, which is crucial for the widespread adoption and promising future of Web3 technologies. And we're going to stay on the subject for security for a bit. Hackers breached the Authy Android app database, exposing the phone numbers of 33 million users. Tulio is the app's developer, and they confirmed the breach in a July 1st security alert and reassured users that account credentials were not compromised. However, the leaked phone numbers might be used for phishing and smishing attacks. Authy is widely used for two-factor authentication by centralized exchanges like Gemini, Crypto.com, Coinbase, and Binance. It generates a code on the user's device, improving account security. This breach occurred through an unauthenticated endpoint. That endpoint has since been secured by Twilio. They urged users to update to the latest app version for better security. Seeking Alpha reported that the Shiny Hunters Cyber Criminal Group leaked the phone numbers. In 2021, this group breached AT&T. They exposed data from 51 million customers. Now, authenticator apps like Authy were created to counter SIM swap attacks. These attacks involve tricking a phone company into transferring a user's number to the attacker, who then intercepts 2FA codes. SIM swap attacks remain common, especially for users who receive 2FA codes via text. On June 12th, Slow Mist reported that OKX users lost millions to such attacks. Twilio assures us that Authy users' authentication codes are safe and that there's no evidence of further system breaches. Nevertheless, users should remain cautious and update their apps to reduce risks. Nintendo is not using generative AI tools in its game development due to concerns about breaching intellectual property. Generative AI's creative potential is acknowledged, but its commercial use depends on the data sets used to train the models. This has led Nintendo to decide against incorporating generative AI in future games. During a shareholders general meeting, Nintendo president Shuntaro Furukawa expressed his reluctance to use generative AI. He noted the risk of IP breaches and emphasized that new technology alone cannot deliver the value that gamers seek. Kurokawa stressed Nintendo's decades of know-how in creating the best gaming experiences. In contrast, Bitcoin developers are working to preserve Nintendo's legacy through blockchain technology. One online group inscribed a Nintendo 64 emulator on the blockchain network. This effort was led by Trevor Owens, CEO of Bitcoin Ordinal's portfolio tracker Ninja Alerts. Their goal is to preserve classic video games using the blockchain. Owens advocates for finding legal ways to preserve these games on-chain. Nintendo's decision to avoid generative AI reflects its commitment to protecting IP while leveraging its extensive experience in game development. Meanwhile, the blockchain community is exploring innovative methods to preserve gaming history and to do so legally. So, what happened? Today's episode discussed the UK's election and its potential impact on the crypto landscape if Labour wins. We examined the SEC's ongoing legal challenges and the broader implications for crypto regulation in the US. We highlighted Germany's significant Bitcoin transactions and their market impact. We covered Nigeria's tech and regulatory advancements, as well as the legal troubles of Binance executives. We also explored Cambodia's blockchain pilot program and the new reporting mandate for banks' crypto exposure. Lastly, we touched on Nintendo's plans for AI and MetaMask's efforts to boost security. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Disruptive Technologies Podcast. We'll see you next time.